Well, welcome to the next phase of our sessions exploring the teaching of technologies education. And now we're going to start looking at some of the context. And this week we're looking at the coding context. So we're going to explore the various solutions that students can develop around coding, um, the applications that they can use to develop solutions, the websites, the games, and the artificial intelligence solutions that they may come up with. Now, essentially, these are a range of tools and technologies that we can utilize in our teaching of technologies education to assist students in developing their understanding of various curriculum concepts and skills associated with those concepts. So let's have a look at some of these. So fundamentally, coding is a set of instructional sequences. Now you've already explored some of that in the tutorials, but we utilize them to create solutions to problems. Now, some of these can be artificial in nature, such as students adding up 10 numbers, but others can be more applied, such as working out a better system for organizing school, um, school buses so that they arrive um, on time and pick up all enough students when there's enough buses for the number of students and things like that. So there are various solutions that can be um, developed through the use of computer code for computer programs. And we see that everywhere in society. So the focus of learning about coding is around students creating such solutions. Now, they'll often be quite abstracted for, for them to understand in schools, but ideally they should reflect real world problems and the types of solutions we would create in the real world. I don't like using the word, the word real world because for, for students, the real world is their school. But in, we often um, develop simulated or structured um, problems and environments in the safe environment of a school that allow students to develop their understanding of various concepts. But we always need to remember that computer programs and coding in general are tools that students will use for solving problems. Now, there are a wide range of such tools and there is a temptation for teachers to go and find the latest interesting new tool. Uh, it might be a new robot kit or an interesting website that they've come across or seen at a conference um, and teach about that tool as though the tool itself is worthy of being taught. And yes, some of the tools do need some teaching how to use a programming language, how to use a robot, how to use a, a weather monitoring um, device. But that should never be the focus of what students are learning. They learn about the tool in order to be able to solve problems. They don't learn about the tool simply for the sake of learning about the tool. And in the past, that has been a criticism of computer education where we learn about Microsoft Excel simply to learn about Microsoft Excel, to learn about a spreadsheet program. That's not effective computer education. We learn about how to use a spreadsheet program in order to solve problems. That becomes much more effective. Okay. And you will, over time, learn about computer programming. Now, having not learned about computer programming yourselves, in the majority of cases, this will be new to you. <coughs> and that's understandable. So it may take you a number of years to become fluent in a programming language. But you only need to stay ahead of your students. Now, certainly over time, you do want to develop some expertise in computer programming. That will allow you to better able to guide your students as they come up with ideas and what they want to create using computer programs. But the fundamentals, particularly in primary school, of what you're teaching are not that complex. 
you've already started learning a number of those concepts in the tutorials already. You're going to learn a few more of them um, this week. And then over this course, you're going to learn more and more of them. And when you start teaching and you start utilizing these tools, you'll build up your expertise in programming. So don't be concerned that you're, you're learning something entirely new. It is new. It is a little bit scary. That's OK. But over time, you will master this, certainly to the level of what's needed in primary school education. You're not going to be qualified as a computer programmer and go out and create the latest new um, software. That's not expected. But you do need to have enough understanding of programming to be able to assist your students in their own learning of computer programming. So some of these aspects of programming. The first set we frame around are what are called code solutions. So you need to understand what coding is. Um, and it's fundamental for all the other aspects of digital technologies concepts around automation and information-based solutions. You need to have a fundamental understanding of what coding involves at a basic level. So coding utilizes programming languages. But we can also see coding around algorithms. You've already looked at algorithms, that step-by-step -step process of solving a problem. And we take an algorithm and we code it using a programming language. We turn it into a set of instructions that are understandable by the computer. Now, our algorithms written in words, sometimes in diagrams such as flowcharts, are not fully understandable by computers. They're getting closer, but they still need to be translated into a language that the computer can understand. They need to be abstracted, taking that extra step. Now, we don't have to turn them into binary or things of that nature. We can turn them into the commands that are set out in a programming language. But we need to understand those commands and how they're structured and how they're placed together and what's called the syntax of those commands. And we utilize various tools to help us with that, such as block-based programming, which makes it a little bit easier. But we need to understand there are a range of different programming languages, some of them more specialized than others. For example, HTML, which is a programming language used for creating websites and web pages, as we use on the internet, is a specialized programming language used for that purpose. And there are other programming languages, such as used for robotic kits. Um, and we're going to look at some of those over the, this session. So throughout F to 6, throughout primary school, students will learn a range of different programming languages, a range of tools that they're going to be able to use in different situations to solve different problems. Some of them will be used for doing robotics pro problems, some for creating an app or a web page or some other solution that's needed. The fundamental concepts that they will learn are around sequencing, doing a series of steps, iteration and branching. They're the three main concepts that students learn in primary school. In high school, they'll go on and learn a range of other concepts. And then if they continue on into a career in computer programming, they'll learn more and more complex concepts. But for primary school, our primary focus is around them learning how to do things in a sequence, how to make selections or choose between different branches of those sequences, and to repeat sequences using what are called loops. OK, so to do that, students need to understand some of these programming languages. Um, and there are a range of tools and websites and books and other environments that can help students learn these. And we call these self-paced tutorials. And you're going, well, you've already seen a couple of these, and you're going to see a few more of these in today's session, where you can learn about these concepts through doing these little tutorial activities, these little activities that guide you through learning about how to do things. Now, these are, again, very contrived and very specific to what the tutorial wants you to solve in terms of a problem. A big part of your job as a teacher is then taking students' skills that they've learnt through these tutorials and assisting your 
students to be able to apply them to solve more um, situated problems. So a problem in their school or for their home or for what they want to solve for their community. And that's a big part of project-based learning. Okay, so in F2, students will learn some really basic ideas about being able to input commands, being able to give some instructions to a device or to a piece of software that's running on their computers or their tablets. And you've seen that with a B-Box, being able to give some input, some instructions to move forward and to turn left and to turn right. Or if it's on a computer program, to give it some instructions to move an object around a screen or to do various other tasks. And these are called command sequences, where the computer program uh, completes these instructions in a sequence to perform some sort of task. And we can also call these scripted commands. Um, we can create little scripts in a word processor or in a spreadsheet that might say in a spreadsheet, it'll add up a column of numbers and then work out the average. And we can write a little script that can do that. So instead of having to put in all these specific individual commands each time, we can just say, calculate the average of this column. And it will then do that. And then we can take it to another column and say, calculate the average of this column. So that is what's called scripting. And within that, when we have more complex um, problems to solve or programs to write, we we use what's called an integrated development environment or an IDE. Scratch is an integrated development environment. Blockly is an IDE. These are just spaces where we can write our computer programs. And generally there'll be a space for us to put in our commands and sometimes where we can see what happens when we run those commands, as you would see in Scratch. Okay, so Traditionally, programming languages are installed on a computer and or installed on an app um, on our tablets or our mobile phones, mobile devices. But more and more, our IDE environments can be done via the web, where we can actually program through the browser interface, the web-based interface. Um, and that makes it a little bit more portable, so we don't have to actually install software. So it makes it easier when you're in a school environment to not have to worry about the software being updated or the programming language being the right version or something's gone wrong and with how it's been installed and it doesn't work. If it's done via a web interface, you can be much more reliant or it's much more reliable in terms of it being effectively available for you to use with your students. It also means they can use the same environment at home or in any device that they have access to via the internet. But these IDEs, these integrated development environments, however they're um, installed, create an ecosystem whereby there are a series of tools and documents and guides and um, what are called code libraries, which are um, example programs or example ways of doing something that you can then grab and put into your program. And also things called debuggers, which will go through and try to identify what mistakes may have been made in writing the program and sometimes various other testing tools. Now in Scratch, they're built in where you have mistakes. It'll tell you that it might have been a mistake and you can run the program and see it um, executing and see obviously things moving around on a screen um, to see whether or not they're doing what was expected to be done. In more complex computer programming languages, often text-based languages, um, you have to compile the program and then run the program separately um, and then see whether or not it actually performs as expected. But for in block-based programming and in the environments that you'll generally be using in primary school, that's all taken care of in the one integrated development environment. So in the early years, there's a number of other tools we can utilize to help students learn and understand programming languages and coding. Our storybooks, there are a range of storybooks that tell stories around different concepts such as doing branching or loops and other concepts within programming. There are games available, and there are various other activities that we can utilize to introduce students to the idea of an algorithm and how we can abstract that algorithm into coded instructions. And we can generally call these manipulables. These are things that students can often move around with their hands 
and rearrange and change how the instructions uh, occur through the physical arrangement of these objects. So there are a few of these I'll just go through. <coughs> this is some of the examples of them. Um, whoops. Um, so in the bottom left hand corner is one where they use these blocks and how, how the blocks are positioned, what, what face is up, provides a different instruction. And children can then lay out these series of instructions by changing which is the top face of the block. Um, some of these other ones are the same. Uh, the Osmo one you see with the iPad actually looks down with using the iPad's camera down on the blocks that the student is arranging in a sequence and will then read how those blocks have been arranged and then perform the instructions on the iPad depending upon how the arrangements are physically. So these allow students to manipulate the objects, it makes it a little bit more tactile. There are also board games that students can um, play that learn about various instructions and coded instructions. And depending upon how they place their cards, they'll then perform various sequences of instructions on the board and they have to move objects around based upon the instructions that have been coded in their cards. And there are storybooks that take students through various stories around um, instructions and more specific um, non-fiction books that help students learn about coding and um, writing computer programs. Okay, so then we have our programming languages, our integrated development environments again. Um, and in primary school, we tend to use more block-based programming languages, such as Days of the Dinosaur and Blockly and Scratch and Foos and Mindstorm. And these set out a, a flow of instructions, uh, which are then processed by the programming language. And students can generally see when branching and loops occur in their instructions. Now, with our algorithms, such as we draw in our flow charts or we write out as instructions called in what's called pseudocode, um, students can design their programs. And then the advantage of block-based programming is that they can place these various blocks similar to how they would have um, designed their program in a flow chart or a series of instructions written out in pencil and paper. And this allows what's called rapid evaluation and modification. They can change things around and adjust things really quickly um, and redesign things in terms of the design cycle um, much more rapidly than if they have to write all their programs out in code and then compile them and then execute them and see how they worked without using a more integrated environment. So the advantage of these um, types of environments, uh, particularly in years three to six, as the students engage with more and more complex problems, is they can see how their pro um, programs execute, how they um, go through the series of instructions and identify where problems might be occurring. That's the visual nature of these environments. So visually, at a glance, students can see what's occurring in the program and whether or not it's happening as it is expected to happen. Text-based programs are less able to do that, but there is a disadvantage of visual programs. Because they need to be visual, you need to be able to um, see all the different instructions at once. As programs get more complex, they eventually reach a point whereby that becomes difficult where they, students can't see all the different things happening at once and um, text-based programming languages then actually become more effective. But for most of the simple programs that we'll have students doing in primary school, they will be able to uh, visualize everything at once on a screen. And so block-based programming is more efficient at a primary level. But in secondary school and beyond, block-based languages um, cease being useful because they can't visualize or they can't um, depict 
all the different aspects of a program at once because the programs are just getting too complex for that. So this idea of abstraction is important though. Again, remember that's one of the key concepts you're going to be teaching your students. Um, so if we were giving some instructions for um, drawing a, a square, we could easily visualize and understand that and keep that in our mind, you know, what's called our working memory. We know we're going to move forward a certain distance, turn right 90 degrees, move forward a certain distance again, turn right and do that four times, and we'll draw a square. Now, doing a much more complex shape, such as drawing a car, would be hard to keep all of those ideas in our head at once. Being able to draw the shape for the for the windows and then the uh, the body and then the wheels, it starts overloading our working memory, which can generally only hold seven to nine ideas in our head at once. So here we can abstract a car into a series of objects. If we abstract it into um, we've got five objects, so a rectangle, two triangles, and two circles, we can keep those five concepts in our head at once and how they relate to each other. And so we could give instructions to the computer or to keep in our head instructions to do a triangle, then another triangle beside that, then a, a rectangle underneath, and then two circles um, beneath the rectangle. That would be abstracted enough so that we could actually conceptualize and understand that. <coughs> so visual programming is useful beyond just abstraction. It also helps us reduce the errors that students make. Now, complex programming languages have to be exact because the computer is quite dumb. It is going to perform instructions exactly as they've been told to perform. And if we make a mistake in that instruction, then it's going to do something else, something that we didn't expect it or intend it to do. So we have to make sure that the, the instructions given can't be open to interpretation. And to do that, we have to give some, some very specific languages or specific language to that and a very specific grammar with particular grammatical rules, such as full stops and semicolons and brackets that, that are going to be interpreted exactly one way. And we call this syntax, um, but it's simply just grammatical rules. How we put brackets around things in a programming language means something very specific, just like we have order operations in arithmetic. Um, if we get things incorrectly incorrect in our order of operations, we get a different calculation, a different answer. Likewise, if we put the brackets or semicolons or full stops in the wrong place in a programming language, it will interpret that and do things differently. So once we understand that, though, we can then write out our commands and we can then reuse them. If I've got some instructions to draw a rectangle, um, I can reuse that whenever I want to draw a rectangle. And if it's been coded correctly, the right syntax, it will always draw a rectangle exactly as I intended it to. And we can have then a collection of these sub-programs. We're talking about shapes. We're going to have a, um, a shape for a triangle and a circle and a rectangle and an oval. And we can then use those whenever we want to draw any sort of um, image. Likewise, we can use a collection of abstracted sub-programs to calculate averages or totals um, or standard deviations, say in a spreadsheet type programming environment. Or in another environment might be uh, fire a missile to in a, in a computer game or move the spaceship to the left or move the spaceship to the right. And these um, sub programs can then be used whenever we want to do that within our larger program. Now, sub programs are a concept that we start getting into just at the very end of primary school and into um, early secondary school. But students will tend to start using them, even though they may not learn it as a specific concept. Um, when they're in primary school. So what students need to absolutely learn in primary school is in years P to 2 or F, F to 2, they will learn to do things in a series of steps. In years 3 and 4, they will learn to be able to make decisions in, our, in their programming. As you did last week when you did the 
choose your own adventure story where a computer program can interpret different um, options and go down different pathways based upon um, the information that it's provided. And then in years five and six, students learn about the concept of looping or repeating code. So for example, um, repeating a square. So we can draw a series of squares, all exactly the same. And in your tutorial this week, you're going to be learning about repeating, where you're going to make um, images with repeated objects. So all of this assists in project-based learning, where students can take all of these ideas and use them to solve problems. So take the idea of being able to make decisions or have a program make decisions or do things repeatedly. And over time, students will learn about these concepts. But don't be obsessed with students' progression around these concepts. They're going to learn these ideas many, many times and use them many, many times in doing various activities and projects and um, uh, tutorial activities and so forth. So don't worry too much about students getting it perfectly each time. They are going to get lots of opportunities to do things in sequences and um, make decisions and do loops. Much more important is that they're developing these higher order thinking skills um, about the concept of ab abstraction and doing things through algorithms and how algorithms can represent um, things in the real world and, and these higher order thinking approaches. Okay, so in students doing these projects, you need to have ways of um, telling them what they need to try to achieve in their programming projects, trying to achieve in terms of their solutions. And we call these specifications. These are what a computer program needs to be able to do so that it solves a problem. So it may be it has to add up a series of numbers or it has to be able to move a spaceship uh, for left and right, up and down. These are things we specify in our, before we start programming, before we start even coming up with the algorithm that will be turned into the program so that students know what has to be achieved. And generally over time, they'll build up a series of um, capabilities so that in the early years they're going to learn to be able to do things in a sequence so when they come to do a problem in years five and six or say sorry years four and five that is going to involve some branching they'll be able to draw upon their ability to do things in a sequence to then branch two sequences um, and this builds up their portfolio of skills of what they can do with computer programming and we can then track their progress and through project-based learning, they can apply these, these skills that they have to solve real-world problems. So one of the challenges for teachers is not to impose your own interests too strongly on students. You will do it partly anyhow. It's, it's a natural process of teaching, but try to allow students to have some engagement with making decisions themselves because a big part of programming and of, of using digital technologies is students choosing the right tools to solve problems they're learning about all of these tools so when they come to solve a problem allow them to choose the tools to then solve the problem it's a big part of their learning with digital technologies so don't always have them do what you want them to do now, yes, you're going to come across new tools and technologies that you want to have students engage with. Say you, you bought a, the class a drone and you want them to learn about a drone. And that's natural and you want to guide them towards using that to solve problems. But try to allow them to at least come up with some ideas on how to use that drone. Maybe it's to have the drone move along and see if it can spot sharks in the water and use the camera of the drone to see if it can identify shapes or it may be for the drone to deliver something like delivering a pizza to uh, um, a lego family in the dollhouse so let them as much as possible explore 
and have excitement over their own ideas of using these technologies. Don't just have your own excitement around what they might be able to use. Say you've got some a new device that um, measures temperature and humidity, and you want to then have the students create a weather station to learn more about um, uh, weather. And that's fine. You want to get the students involved and excited about that. But try to allow them to have some involvement with that process as well. This leads into the idea again of constructivism as a learning theory where students construct new knowledge based upon their previous knowledge. Um, but if it's aligned to their interests, it's going to be much more effective because they'll be engaged with wanting to learn about this new knowledge. Um, and this though then often relies upon student-centered approaches because different students will have different things that excite them. They'll also have different prior knowledge. So if we're going to build upon prior knowledge and build upon their interests and excitement, we need to then differentiate and allow students to explore different ways of approaching a problem. But project-based learning in doing that can reduce the resources we might need. If you want to have, do, have all the students do exactly what you want them to do, then you have to have them all have the same equipment and do the same problem. And that can often be quite intensive in terms of your resources, because you've got to have enough for every student. If the students are all doing different things, then they might use different equipment and different um, items for doing their different approaches. So a couple of students might be using some of the robotic kits. Some of them might be creating a computer game just on the computer. Others might be using some spreadsheet software. And so the amount of duplication of resources can be a lot less when you allow student-centered project-based learning to occur. They can also share and form project groups around their different ideas. Um, what's particularly powerful is when they start taking different approaches and building them together. So the group that was doing something with spreadsheets might then join together with the group that was doing something, say, for a website and create an interactive online database um, with their two approaches. OK, so take a break now and I want you to explore a um, online, online tutorial about making monsters using various shapes and a programming language. So have a little look at that and see what you can come up with. And then we'll come back and explore our next topic. OK, so hopefully you've been able to explore the Make a Monster um, activity and created some various shapes and new interesting monster-based um, solutions. Okay, why is that not working? There we go. Okay, now we're going to look at application solutions. Applications are simply software. They're programs that do something. Now, sometimes we see the word app and think applications just happen on mobile devices. That software applications have been around since computers have existed. And they are simply programs that do things on our computers, on our digital devices. They might be, say, a word processor or a web browser or a computer game. Pretty much anything um, is an application. The only thing we don't really frame as applications are the things that run applications, which is our operating system. So your Windows operating system or your um, Macintosh operating system, um, which is a set of software that's used to allow applications to run on a computer. Um, but generally, most things that run on our computers or on any of our digital devices, we call applications. And students can make applications and they can then use these applications, which can then solve a range of problems. So apps are generally small applications that run on mobile devices. And they used to be sort of considered separate. Of course, they were often very small applications. It might be to make a fart sound 
or to make a light shine or turn the, the screen on bright so that it looks like a torch. Um, and they were really simple to uh, program because they didn't do much. But over time now, we're seeing much more involved applications that can run on our mobile devices, full-blown word processors and uh, photo editing software and pretty much anything that could run on a normal computer can now run on our mobile phones. So the distinction between an app for a mobile device and an application running on a desktop computer is very much disappeared. And indeed, we're now starting to see applications run in browsers um, through our web browsers. And that's taking things to another level again. But for many years, the idea of the app of the web app revitalized computing and computer education because these apps were much simpler. So it wasn't like students had to write an entire word processor or entire office application or photo editing uh, application. They could write a little program that did a, a very simple thing on a mobile device and they could often be very popular and they could have tens of thousands of people downloading them and using them on their mobile devices. So it allowed um, simple applications to be popular again. Now, over time, that's starting to disappear as we get um, collected applications built into one larger application, such as an office suite or things of like that. And having lots of little applications is becoming less popular. And more and more now, people are having a couple of dozen applications that they just use that do hundreds of things rather than hundreds of applications that do one or two things. <coughs> but the App Store and the way of distributing software was developed because of these little applications. And we now see most of our software being deployed through these app stores rather than having to go to a shop and buy a disk or, um, or, and install it on our, on our computers and things of that nature. But increasingly now, we're also seeing um, web-based software whereby you subscribe to the software, so you pay for it through a subscription, and you've always got access to it as long as you've got access to the internet. Um, and that's changing things again. But the main aspect of application software is generally you've got some sort of interface where you can sort of see something happening and you've got some sort of way of making things happen, what we call inputs, which might be tapping on things on the screen or pressing buttons on the, or moving a mouse or typing things on a keyboard. And we've got some sort of outputs, something that happens, which often happens on the screen or it might happen through the speakers in terms of music or um, sometimes other devices that are attached to a device or computer. <coughs> so that's different to an operating system, which just allows us to um, run applications. Uh, but it's an important element of computing that students need to learn about operating systems and about application software. And that, again, will be something that you will teach them in the early years, um, grades three to four, I think we focus on that, that they form what are called digital systems, where we have keyboards that provide inputs. We have outputs, which are printers and um, computer screens, things of that nature. And we have then software that runs on those that does something between that input and output stage. And we also have uh, connections to networks where we can then send information to other computers um, and do things through our network software. And a lot of this comes down to abstraction again. We don't have to worry about exactly how a mouse works in terms of the signals it sends to the computer. We simply need to know that it's abstracted, but if we move the mouse left, we will have instructions sent to the computer screen to move an object on the screen left, which is normally the cursor, but say in Scratch, we can have it um, so that when the mouse moves left, it moves an icon in Scratch to the left or to the right and so forth. Okay, so we can also then attach other devices to our computers. And in education, we often um, attach little, uh, little hardware devices that have some um, 
buttons and LEDs, little lights that will light up and we can press buttons and we can do things with these. Um, next week we're going to look at these in more detail, but just to know at the moment we can um, utilize these to give instructions, not just to the computer, but we can have other devices that we can either take instructions from, such as buttons. And you saw a little bit of this with the Makey Makey kits, where we could connect those up to our computers and we could then create our own input devices, input um, commands, such as a banana keyboard, where we can tap different bananas and they would send different instructions in terms of inputs to our computer that they would then do different things. Okay, so again, we need to always keep in mind though, that we're not focused on using applications. We're focused on students then taking these skills and applying them to the real world. The fact that they can make a banana keyboard, how can that now be applied to the real world? Maybe it's someone that's disabled and they can only move their elbows, um, and but they can tap various large objects, say on their wheelchairs, to then send signals to the computer to do different things, which may be to move the wheelchair around, or it may be to use a voice synthesizer to speak different um, command or different, uh, different words. So it's students using these skills around application software to then do something with those to solve some sort of problem. Now, for programming languages to be able to do that, we need to now give some instructions for how that occurs. And we do this by what's called a programming language and, and using that syntax, which we talked about before, which needs to be exactly set out so that there's no misinterpretation. Say with the makey makeys, um, if we had two different um, buttons attached to the one input, if we pressed A and we pressed C, and they both told the computer to do the same thing, that would cause problems. That would be an, um, an error. Now, the program would work, but it would do things unexpectedly if we pressed um, those keys and didn't expect them to do the same thing. Okay, so take another break now. We've looked at, at application software and I want you to have a look at an integrated development environment for creating applications. Now, this is called the App Lab. Now, it's quite involved. I don't expect you to go into it in huge amount of depth, but just go through it quickly and just see how easy it is to create these apps. And this uses a metaphor for a mobile app. So this is students creating apps for mobile devices for a tablet or a mobile phone or things of that nature. But the same ideas can be applied for any um, environment. It's students setting out the interface and then having some sort of input, say um, buttons or keystrokes or mouse movements that then have the application do different things. And some of the ones you'll just explore are changing colors on the screen and making sounds occur and things of that nature. Okay, so try that out and then we'll come back and look at our next section on websites. Okay, so hopefully you've been able to create some interesting applications using the App Lab tutorial and can see how easy it is for students to create what we call apps. But let's look at some other applications now. I'm going to look at a particular type of application that's very commonly used, and that's through the web, web pages, or what's called a web browser, and allows us to then access and utilize the internet. Because that's a very powerful tool that we use to access information. And in a couple of weeks time, we're going to look at information-based solutions. But today we're looking at the, how actual um, website solutions work. Um, in a few weeks' time, we'll look at all the different ways we can apply our knowledge of how websites work and how the internet works. But for now, we're just focusing on solving problems using our understanding of websites. So, for example, if students had to um, survey 100 students in the school, yes, they could print out 100 different um, paper-based surveys and take them around and have every student um, use them. 
or they could set up some kiosks, a computer kiosk where students could come to the computer and do the survey. Or they could set up a web-based survey where they could just give the students a web address and everyone could go in at their own time to that web page, fill in the survey and collect all the data that way. So it's a more efficient way of solving that particular problem. Um, and web pages in the main have been most useful in distributing knowledge. So for example, if students created storybooks, yes, they could print them off and share them that way, or they could put them, digitize them, put them onto a web page and share their stories in a more efficient way through um, that particular solution. <coughs> so the first thing we need to understand about web pages is the idea of a universal resource locator. And essentially, this is the web address. You're all used to putting them into the top of your web browsers, but you probably don't really understand how they actually work. So it's called a universal resource locator. So essentially, it's how to find things on the internet. Of course, the key concept of, a, of the internet is that everything is somewhere on a computer. And the universal resource locator is the address to go and find that thing and bring it back to your computer. So your computer, if it's set up as a web server, you could then make the files that are sitting on your computer, say a Word document, available to anyone on the internet if you are running it as a web server. Now, you would then also need a web address, and we'll talk about those in a second. But if it was being done so, then the files that are on your computer are then made available to anyone that knows the right address. And that's what you're doing when you use a web address. You're going to a computer that's on the internet running a web server that's made that file available to share. Um, and your web browser is simply an application that will show certain types of files. Um, generally call these HTML files, hypertext markup language files. Um, which is a particular, oh, have we got to that bit yet? But talk about HTML in a little bit. So your URL, your universal resource locator is an abstraction of what's called an internet protocol, which is a series of numbers. Um, so again, we're not good at remembering numbers. So we have a web address such as www.griffith.edu.au, which in reality is a whole series of numbers, so about 30 numbers. Um, but having them in words, having them abstracted as words, makes it easiest for easiest for to remember. We can also sometimes shorten long word-based um, URLs using what's called a URL shortener, particularly if it has lots and lots of um, randomized letters and numbers as part of a long, long address. And you all would have seen some of those. And we can also sometimes use QR codes, which is a way of graphically um, representing a web address. Uh, you've all seen QR codes um, and they again simply represent some sort of instructions for how to find something. So the key thing we need to understand though is that each URL points to a single particular location. Um, now at that location, sometimes though it can have multiple files and that's where we have the slash and then more instructions about which thing at that location to then send back. But it's a unique address and it's used to share information. We make a request from our what's called a HTTP client, which is your web browser, to a HTTP server, hypertext protocol server, um, which then sends the information back to your computer, your web browser that requested it. So in terms of the actual address, the protocol is the sort of information that's being transferred. We have other protocols such as um, uh, file transfer protocols, FTP, um, and there's, there's a few others more specialized ones. But on the internet, the two main ones nowadays are HTTPP and HTTP. HTTPS, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. 
Um, and then you have the address of the, um, what's called a domain name. And we have what's called a host name. Most of them is www, but it can be others as well. And then there's the domain name. And then once we get to, to the domain, we have then a directory path on the computer, which is the file name or the file folder. And then within that folder, there is a specific file that we want to return, which in this case is called index.html, which is an actual specific document file. Okay, so <clears throat> the key aspect of all of that is that in order to share, we have to have um, our computer running a piece of software called a web server. Um, and what that is, is simply a piece of software that uh, allows some, a request to come into our computer and then it will then find the file and then send it back to whoever requested it. But in order for that to work, um, the internet, everything, other places on the internet need to know that our computer is set up to receive those requests. So it has to be registered. And that's what we call registering a domain name. Um, a school has a registered domain name. The university has a registered domain name. Many individuals don't. Um, I do. I have jason.sagami.info as a registered domain name where I host and serve um, resources. And most businesses register and have a domain name so that people can find things. But a lot of individuals don't necessarily have, have a domain name. So they can't just share what's on their computer. Um, but once that domain name has been registered, it's then indexed and information about um, how to find that computer is then stored on other computers. Um, and these are then utilized to share information about on the web, on the internet. So as an example, it might be that a school tuck shop. Um, in order to get something at the tuck shop, you have to know what you want to ask for. Uh, you might want to ask for a, a packet of chips. So the tuck shop staff need to know that the chips are there they need to know how to find them. And you have to know, know where the tuck shop is to go to it and get the chips um, if you ask for them. And so all of that is done through these universal resource locators, which are instructions about the specific thing you want and where you want it from. <coughs> and then the internet uses a whole lot of um, things called domain name servers which are the sets of instructions of where to find things. So when you want your packet of chips, it needs to go to the domain name server and say, okay, that's located at the tuck shop. And it then sends back to your computer or tells you that you need to go to the tuck shop to go and find your packet of chips. And then you'll get, the, you'll then have the instructions of where to find the tuck shop. And then you follow those instructions to the tuck shop and then the tuck shop will then give you the packet of chips and send it back to your computer. <laughs> so essentially that's how the internet works. You have these addresses registered on domain name servers. And so if I want to get a um, bit of information from, in this case, a server in New Zealand, at Springfield High, um, there's a, a lesson plan that a friend of mine has put on their computer at Springfield High in New Zealand. Um, their domain name, springfieldhigh.edu.co.nz, is registered. And so I can then um, put that into my web browser. It will then go to Springfield High. And I've also put after the slash the file name that I want, which is lessonplan3.html. And of course, it's um, that information is on the actual computer in Springfield High. Um, my request will then be acknowledged. It will then grab that file and send it back to me. And this is all done through what are called gateway routers. So there's one router in New Zealand that then receives all of those requests and then looks at the um, name of the, of the domain and says, okay, this is for Springfield High. 
and sends the request off to Springfield High. It then receives that, works it out, and then sends it back. Okay, so all of that is um, a brief introduction to how the internet works. There's lots of other resources and video clips that you can use with your students that help explain this in more detail. There are games you can play and lots of different activities that you can go through to help students understand how the internet works. Um, and this is just going in more detail. Once um, the request has been made, uh, the whole thing is reversed because the computer that's now received this request doesn't necessarily know um, who sent the request. Uh, what came with the request is instructions to find your computer, which is essentially the reverse. Um, it needs to go back and look at the domain of, of um, where your computer is located, say in, in Australia, in a computer at Griffith University, and then it will send attach in what's called a packet, the file, and follow back in reverse the instructions um, back to your computer. And then your browser will then show the file that you requested, which is done in what's called hypertext markup language, which is a particular programming language used to display things in a web browser. Um, how to show different fonts, how to show images in different locations on your, on your web page, how to play video clips, are all contained in what's called HTML, which is a language, a computer programming language, specific for use in browsers to show information on web pages. And this is just a little bit of a breakdown of the language. Um, it uses these, what are called tags, uh, which we start a tag and we end a tag. So looking at the title tag, we see title, then we have some text, and then we see close the title tag, which means within the title and the closing title tag, um, we're going to format it as a as a title, as a so the text will be larger and in bold. And then we've got headings, so we've got heading one and heading two. We've got different types of headings, which will be different types of fonts and different sizes. Um, so you're going to explore that in a little bit, but we can also um, do the same sort of thing with mobile apps, which can, um, we can have web pages show as a, on our mobile devices. And a lot of simple um, mobile apps are simply web pages. They look like an app, but they just happen like a web page. They go and get information and they display it back on the mobile device's screen. Uh, more complex apps, as you saw with AppMaker, use a programming language um, to write a particular app. Uh, but web apps uh, simply display web pages that look like apps, but aren't really. Okay, so as you learn more about how the internet works and how networks work, you may get to a point where you want to allow your students to actually learn about running servers themselves so they can share information out to the world, um, share documents, share information. But they can also run servers that could do more complex things, such as a Minecraft server, which runs the Minecraft game. And so if they're running their own Minecraft server, um, other students can log into that server and all participate in the same um, game environment. So all be running around in the same mi Minecraft environment. That's actually quite simple to do. And lots of lots of primary school age students run their own servers at home. Um, and many schools run their own school servers. And in fact, there's an education version as well, which allows teachers to have more control and set lessons up within Minecraft EDU servers. But running a server is not that complex. It's simply an application running on a computer that allows sharing of information, um, requests to come in and information to be passed out. In terms of a Minecraft server, it allows students to request to be allowed to access it and to receive information on where their little Minecraft person is moving around on a particular Minecraft map. Um, they're a little bit complex. You need to understand 
a bit more than what we've just run through today, but not that much more complex. And there are lots of primary school students and primary school teachers that run um, servers. You have to work within the framework of what's permissible within your school acceptable use policies and processes, but you'll have technicians that can assist with that more technical and policy um, processes. But don't be afraid of exploring some other things that you might be able to do around the use of the internet. Again, something you'll learn slowly over time. Um, the other aspect that we've talked a bit about before is that more and more um, our applications and information is being stored online, where we have our, say, our web our email is done online. Say with Google um, Gmail, it's all done online. You don't have to install uh, an email program on your computer. You can just do it all through a web browser. Um, and there's also the apps that are done, say, um, uh, Microsoft Office Online is done in the cloud. Um, Google Office applications, Google Docs and PowerPoint, or Google Slides and things are done in the cloud, as we call it, which are software run on a server that's running that software somewhere else. So it's not happening on your computer. The software application is running on a computer somewhere else in the world. Now, it might be here at Griffith University. It might be on a, a computer running on a Google um, server in the United States. But this, the program is running not on your computer, but someone else's computer. That's what we call cloud computing. Okay, now I'll take another break and learn a little bit more about HTML and creating websites. You're gonna go through a quick little five minute website tutorial that will teach you some of those concepts around HTML that I was just referring to. So give that a go, and then we'll come back and look at computer game solutions. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to build a website, very simple one, of course, but you should have a more of an understanding now of some of the, how simple um, the HTML website coding process is. HTML is probably one of the most simple programming languages there are. Of course, it has to be very simple because it's got to be transmitted across the internet. And certainly in days gone by, the internet was very, very slow. And the information that was going to be transmitted had to be very concise and specific. Nowadays, with our faster broadband, we can have much more complex applications run on the internet. Um, and we see that with cloud-based um, uh, solutions. But HTML sort of comes from a time when everything had to be simplified. OK, let's look now at game-based solutions. Now, our students use games a lot in their leisure time, and particularly computer games are very popular nowadays. Not every student, but by far the vast majority. And they are very engaging. They're designed for recreational activities. That's what they're primarily used for. But we can also co-opt them for use in education and use that for, through a concept called game-based learning. But in digital technologies, we can also utilize students making games to solve problems. The games themselves can be used to solve some sort of issue or problem. Now, often that's an information or awareness problem, such as a sun safety or uh, traffic safety. We can make a game that helps teach students about things. And the students can make those games. They can also be used to help them with their study, like making a flashcard game to help them learn uh, words or vocabulary, um, through to having games that simulate aspects of the real world, where students can explore what it's like to uh, be a farmer or fly a plane um, through simulations. But there are a whole range of different um, applications of games. And these can be used to help students learn about things. But the focus of digital technologies, of course, is not just using applications, using games. It's about students creating games. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. But first, let's look at the range of games that are available. So there are lots of categories of games, uh, fighting games, shooter games, music games, sports games. 
we're going to break these down into just a few categories of, of action, strategy, adventure, simulation, puzzle, and educational, but there are many others. But let's have a look at some of these. So action games generally have some sort of action happening on the screen. Um, some sort of characters moving around a maze or jumping over platforms. Um, fighting games often fit within this sort of framework um, and shooting games, but they have things where uh, there's some sort of action-based activity occurring. Then we have what are called strategy games, which often involve much more complex um, processes where uh, the students or the players might be managing a city or a country and they have to think through a whole lot of strategies about how to do that effectively. Then you've got adventure games where students engage with a particular um, context, so it might be ancient Greece, and they have to solve problems and interact and engage with various activities within that um, space. And they can generally go through a series of quests and many of them use a film-based metaphor where they're going through and completing a story as they would through a storybook or a film um, that are doing so through the actions of a character um, in a game environment, which tends to be somewhat richer than a film or story-based um, or textual story-based uh, story because they can make a lot more decisions and take many different pathways. Then we have simulation games. So we have more traditional things like the flight simulator and driving simulators. But we've also got many sports simulators where we take on very sporting actions like playing um, tennis or football, things of that nature. And then we have a whole lot of what are called fictional life simulations. So what it would be like to be a, a, a chef or to go to university um, or to raise a family and have a whole lot of problems to be solved through these simulations. And then you've got more um, adult oriented simulators like economic simulators or one of the very first ones was running a nuclear power station and choosing different things and seeing what occurred as a result of different choices. But there's a whole range of different simulations that are available and these can often be very related to education. And then we have um, a range of games that are focused on solving puzzles more directly. There can be visual matching puzzles like Tetris where we have to match things, hidden objects. And, uh, there's a whole range of different types of puzzle games where the focus is on solving a specific puzzle or a series of puzzles. And these can help students develop their creative thinking and um, thought processes. And then we have more specific educational games designed specifically for education. Um, such as things for teaching students about geography or history, such as Carmen San Diego and things of that nature. Then there's more what we call serious games, which are designed to teach students specific skills or understandings. Um, America's Army was a first person shooter. It was designed to teach students about what would be like to be in the army. And there's a whole range of sort of uh, games that are focused around learning uh, real world skills. And then we have programming games. And this brings us back more into line with what we focus on in digital technologies, where students use the games to uh, learn about specific concepts in computing. Um, and these are things where, particularly in robot, robot battles, where they, they perform various algorithms um, and those coded instructions are carried out by the game. Now, some of these games are non-digital, such as board games, but they're also digital ones where um, these instructions are carried out. So thinking back to um, the use of the B-Bots, where the B-Bots moved around based on various instructions, if part of the game was if the B-Bots collided, then you lost, then having students code their instructions and having the B-Bots try to move from one side of the classroom to the other side of the classroom without colliding with one another would be a, a coding game um, that students could then implement. And that's similar to what these sort of coding battle games are, um, where the, the robots do various things and compete against one another. <coughs> but much more important for digital technologies 
is students being able to create their own games. And all of the games we've just looked at, all the different genres, have environments that allow students to also create them. Um, often not to the same level as the commercial games are, but allowing students to be creative and create their own games is a really important um, tool set that you have as a digital technologies teacher. Now, some of them can be used for purely artistic purposes, such as some of the things you're going to do in tutorial, creating um, a, a graphical artistic work through the um, programming environment. And some of them can be entrepreneurial, where they're creating the games to make money. Um, but most of the games can be used for creating um, solutions to problems. It may be just the problem is around entertainment. You want a game that is engaging and fun and you make money by selling it. And so it, it can be as purely simple as that. But we try to get students to, rate, to create more applied problems, such as maybe teaching students, younger students, about um, sun safety. Um, so whereas the character moves around, they've got, they've got to move from shade to shade to avoid the sun. And if they're in the, in the sun too long, then the character burns up things like that. So learning about things of that nature. If they, they pick up the hat or pick up the sunscreen, then they can survive in the sun longer. So there are ways that students can utilize games to solve real world applied problems. Um, there can also be aspects around mastering gameplay. So becoming good at playing the game, particularly when it involves certain concepts such as knowing more about geography makes them better able to uh, perform well in the game. Knowing more about history, being able to do well in the game. Sometimes mathematics, some of the games I used to play in, in high school, involved um, what's called vector mechanics, where you had to work out how a spaceship was going to move when various forces were applied to that spaceship. And so you had to learn some fairly complex mathematics in order to be able to do well in that game. So. There are lots of ways that games can be used more than just for entertainment, but as solutions to problems. So there's also equity issues around the use of games and of the playing of games. So don't always assume that every student is going to engage with the use of games. They generally all with, with some sorts of games. But as I just went through, there are many different genres and types of games. Not every student is going to like first person shooter games, for example, or sports games or puzzle games. But there are lots of different types of games. And as long as you allow students different choices and differentiate your teaching and allow them to engage with either creating games or playing games that they're interested in and can see applications for, then that will allow them to engage with that. But if you force them to use a particular type of game or genre of game that they're not interested in or engaged with, then that will be problematic. Okay, so to create games, students need to have a particular programming language that we call a game engine. Now, these are um, generally sim simplified programming environments that allow students to create games. Scratch can be seen as a game engine for creating games in Scratch. It's also a more generalized programming environment, but it can also be seen as a game engine. And there are lots of these game engines that exist that allow students to create um, games. Some of them can be very involved. Some of them are used for creating the commercial games where they have hundreds, if not thousands of programmers using the environment to create a single game and it may take them a year or two years to create that game. And students can actually have access to and utilize those environments, but they are way too complex. Um, so we need to be uh, guide students towards using um, game, in, game engine environments that they're capable of engaging with. And this can be really hard because students will want to try to create the games that they are most passionate about, which can often involve the use of the most complex of these game environments. Um, so having, guiding them as a teacher towards using simplified game environments to learn the fundamentals of how, to, of how computer games work, moving objects around like in Scratch um, and having them collide with other objects is an important first step.
that they need to master before they can go on and become game developers with the more complex environments that will involve hundreds of hours of learning about how to use those environments more effectively. That said, some of your students will want to do so. Um, so as much as we can dissuade them, they're going to engage with these environments and some of them will be successful. They will engage, they'll put that amount of time into learning these environments and that's fine. But for most purposes, particularly in, a, in the constraints of time in our lessons, in our, in our school environment, we need to guide students towards more simplified game environments. Okay, so over time though, students will build up their skills with creating games, if that's their area of interest. Um, but they will start with those text-based storytelling games that you did um, last week using Twine, where we made really simple decision-making choices. Then they'll move to changing other existing games and we can use environments such as um, Scratch for doing that quite effectively, where students can take an existing game and then modify it to make it different for a different context or change things around a little bit and learn about how the game works through doing what's called modding and eventually moving towards creating games on their own. So let's take another break now and again, look at how easy it is to make games by going through a quick um, tutorial to create what's called a, uh, the Flappy game, which is uh, a game that was actually very popular on mobile devices, um, where a little bird has to flap through a, uh, a maze and avoid hitting the pipes. And you'll see how quick and easy it is to make a simple game. So try that out. And then we're going to come back and look at our final context, which is artificial intelligence. OK, so hopefully you've managed to create your Flappy Bird game and get your little birds flapping through the maze without hitting the, the pipes and have seen that it's quite simple for you or for your students to be able to make these simple games. So let's now though look at our final context for problem solving, artificial intelligence solutions. Now, most of these will be done in older years in high school, but students need to start becoming aware of the power of artificial intelligence relatively early. So essentially, we use artificial intelligence where we try to create software and applications that replicate how human beings do things, particularly in how human beings think and problem solve. And we can do many of the things that um, humans could do now with computers, where computers can play games such as chess and Go and things of that nature. They can see things and recognize them as different objects. They can speak and use language as we use language, and they can understand the words we say and interpret those. All of these things weren't able to be done 30 years ago. Um, but as we've developed more and more applications and understanding of how humans do these things, we've been able to program uh, computers to be able to do these things. And we put these under a set of tools called artificial intelligence. So one of the very first tools is around being able to make decisions. Like we've done with um, the storytelling using Twine, where we've made branch decisions. There's a whole set of decision making that's done in what's called artificial intelligence programs. Playing a game of chess is simply a whole series of decisions. And if we make um, have an understanding of enough of those decisions, we can program a computer to be able to play the game by simply looking at the options um, and by following through a huge big decision tree coming up with um, the various options to do at different stages and winning games of chess and that's how many of our programs for playing chess have evolved there's some more complex ways of doing it as well but that's certainly how the original ones were and how a lot of the ai built into our computer programs are uh, simply a series of decisions. If these things are happening, then do these things. 
So having those selections and decisions is a big powerful part of much of the power of computing. Um, chatbots, which you've probably come across on web pages, are again, a simple way of having a conversation using those series of decisions where it will ask you a question um, and you will give an answer and it will then respond based upon that response or based upon your response. And by having adding more and more different answers, we can build out a chatbot that can answer more and more complex uh, questions and have a simulated conversation. Now, again, there are other more complex ways of doing that with artificial intelligence, but at a simple level, most chatbots are simply a series of decisions, just as you did with your uh, Twine story. That's how a chatbot works. And students can program a chatbot to be able to do the same thing. And it might be asking questions about an assignment. Um, when is it due? And it will then give a response. Um, how many words can it be? Can we have to do the assignments? And it will then give a response. And by having a relatively large number of different possible questions and answers, it will seem as though it's having a lifelike human conversation. But in reality, it's simply responding to prompts and then decisions about how to respond to that prompt. Now, expert systems build upon that, which was an idea that we would take the expertise of someone. Um, the original one was around a train engineer, where a train engineer was going to be retiring, and they had a huge amount of expertise that they were, the company was really worried that once they retired, no one was going to be able to solve a whole lot of problems to do with these um, train engines. Of course, no one had the same level of expertise and um, historical understanding. And so they went about trying to capture all that expertise and turned it into what was called an expert system, which again was simply a whole series of, of questions and answers and, and prompts. And by having enough of those, and sometimes they went through a se sequence um, where you would answer one question and then based upon that response, it would ask different questions, just as you did with your Twine storytelling. Um, but they were able to then capture all of the expertise of this expert so that a, a novice engineer would be able to come along and look at the problem put in a whole lot of answer a whole lot of questions and then receive the same sort of understanding and approach that the expert would have done to trying to solve that problem and that's now been done for doctors and for a whole lot of other lawyers and a whole lot of other experts building these expert systems so that then novices can come along ask a whole series of questions and then get the advice on what they should do as a result. So these expert systems, your students could build. Um, they could go and interview an expert. Let's say it's the tuck shop person and about how to run a tuck shop effectively and to uh, manage all the different parents and so forth. And so they would ask a whole lot of questions and get the responses. And then so a new parent coming along to take over the tuck shop could have access to that expert system and ask these questions and receive the responses and then know how to run the tuck shop. And so your students could make that for these new incoming tuck shop um, people. Or they could do it for lots and lots of different problems. How to look after the goldfish in the goldfish for the, the class goldfish. Um, whole lots of different um, problems that can be solved through creating simple expert systems. And it's a powerful tool that you've got available for your students to create as solutions to problems. Again, we in the curriculum, we don't tend to do it until a bit later, but decision making can be done in years three and four. And so that students could make simple expert systems in years three and four. Beyond that, Artificial intelligence uses a set of technologies called neural networks, which is how our brain processes information with lots of inputs, um, how they all interact with one another within inside our brain, and then it tells us to do various things in terms of outputs. And we train those neural networks. It's relatively complex, um, but very, very powerful. So for example, with um, looking at x-rays to try to detect cancer, we've been able to show um, a neural network thousands and thousands of these images. 
and then indicate which of those have cancer and which don't. And by running it through these neural networks, it's been able to build up what's called pattern analysis. And so we can detect uh, patterns in the x-rays and indicate whether or not they're likely to show that they have cancer or not. Now, a human expert does the same, but an artificial intelligence computer program can do that so much more efficiently. And it can look at hundreds of thousands of images, build its patterns, and is much more accurate then at detecting um, irregularities in what it detected to be seen, um, or regularities in terms of what it should see if it was cancerous, far more accurately than human beings can. And that's now being applied into things such as um, automatic driving cars and a whole range of other ways where we can put a lot of information in and build patterns and then have the computer um, recognize those patterns far more effectively than we can do so as human beings. Um, and so that's a, a brand new field of artificial intelligence that's been exploding over the last few decades. Um, again, using what human beings can do, but through the power of computers, being able to do it so much more effectively, simply because they can do it so quickly, so much more quickly. It's a really simple program. Um, and again, we'll have students in um, junior high school doing programming those things of, of using images and image recognition. And there are teachers doing it in primary school, but it's not part of the curriculum there. So, um, but students need to be understand, able to understand that this is why digital technologies are so important. They are able to solve problems so much more efficiently and effectively than human beings can. And over time, they are going to replace human beings in a lot of, of the jobs we currently do because of this capability. And we'll have to then work out ways of doing other things where as humans, we are still more effective and efficient than computers are. Okay, so that's the area of coding. The, the different types of solutions that students can create through coding um, and their power of coding to solve problems. So in tutorial this week, you need to develop a bit more of an understanding of coding. So I want you to do an hour of code activity before the tutorial. And if you go to the website, you'll see a whole range of different hour long activities. Well, they're hour long for students. Most teachers or pre-service teachers can get through them in about 15 to 20 minutes. Of course, you're generally a bit more efficient, but these were set up to be able to be done in short, uh, concise tutorial activities. So you'll see a range of them. Pick one, just as you did um, in the start of the course, but this is a different set, um, which is a little bit more complex. And then in the tutorial, you're going to use another integrated development environment, another programming language called Pencil Code. And we're going to focus on a particular approach to understanding coding through the creation of geometrical shapes. And so you're going to learn with the guidance of your tutors, um, the creation of these geometrical shapes and see how we can use them to create really complex geometrical shapes. We get to that stage in the tutorial um, and some really interesting artistic works through the use of programming and the idea of looping and repetition and how powerful that can be um, in programming. Okay, so that's it for this week. So we've explored um, coding as a concept. And then next week, you're going to be going through and looking at um, automation processes, uh, robotic devices and other devices that we use to solve problems using our programming, but then applying the programming to actually make some sort of device do things. So that's it for this week.